Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Lilia and Lou's podcast. In this edition, we're going to give you the latest news, which has some interesting new releases. We are also going to give you an interview with Bev Vincent about his uh, Dark Tower book. And Lou, you have more on that? Yeah, that's right. It's a great interview, so I'm, I'm hoping you'll stick around to listen to it. We get into some very interesting stuff that Bev goes into more detail in his book, the, his new book, The Dark Tower Companion. We're going to find out some interesting things about Roland's family, in that there might be more to that family than you're aware of. And there's also some great interviews with Ron Howard and Akiva Goldsman about the Dark Tower movies and how they're planning to handle them if that ever comes to bear. And Bev is also going to talk about the interview he had with Stephen King and how we tried to press him on some Dark Tower tidbits. Welcome, welcome. Do not fear the door that lies before you. We will protect you. We are your guides, Hans and Lou, and we will give you the latest in Stephen King news. But before we do so, you must prove yourself worthy. You must open the door and join us in the death room. But first, let's start with the news. Yes, a new release called Ghost Brothers of Darkland County. And we have been talking about this one for quite some time. It's been it's it's actually a stage play that King wrote with John Mellencamp and T Bone Brunette did uh, the stage play for it. And we have been waiting for this book to be released, and now it has been. And in several editions, we might add. You have one where you just have the music and you have one with the music and a DVD, which I must say I'm a little bit disappointed about. It's a very short DVD. And then you have a book that's the format of a the old uh, Times record. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure what it's called in English. LPs. LPs, yeah. yeah it's the same as in Sweden. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and it, it's the same size. And mm -hmm. uh, in that one, you also get the libretto by King. Right. So you have those editions, and there's also an ebook version in which you have the. It, it's basically the the same as the big hardcover edition. And while you're reading it, you can hear music, see photos, see clips. So it's it's a very interesting book actually. So uh, and we're going to talk more in in depth about that in our next podcast. But there has been a lot of press done for this book. Uh, King and Mellencamp and T Bone has been on several TV shows promoting the book. and So if, if you have missed those, you can go to Lilia's library. You can check out both the both, uh, pictures and clips of it. As Hans said, we'll get into a more in-depth review in, in our next podcast. Like Hans, I have the hardcover edition, the LP edition. Overall, I really like the package, but Hans said we'll talk about that more in depth in our next podcast. Yeah. One thing more we can mention just uh, before we go to the next item is that the tour of Ghost Brothers happening in the U.S. this fall is a bit special because it won't be the entire play. It will be the actors uh, singing and saying the line like if they are recording a, a radio play. Mm -hmm. So it won't be the full stage. Mm -hmm. with all the settings and everything. It's, it will be more like listening to a radio play. Yeah, which is very interesting. Yeah, We'll, we'll have um, to see what the reviews are for that. I think yeah. you need a little bit of props, but we'll see how it works. Yeah. yeah. All right, up next, of course, Joyland it has been out now for a couple of weeks, and I have the paperback version. I don't know if the limited editions are out or not. Did you get a limited edition, Hans? No, I didn't. No? It was okay. a little bit too expensive for my right. wallet. Uh, yeah. And so I hope you all enjoyed that. As far as King books go, it's it's a pretty short book. It's only 283 pages, but uh, short reviews. I enjoyed it quite a bit. And uh, we'll talk about that book also in more depth in our next podcast. Give you guys a chance to read it first so that we don't spoil anything for you. And the next item is Under the Dome, which has been heavily promoted by 
CBS the last week. We have been shown pictures of the cast. We have gotten several posters from it. We have a, a, a blog that's supposed to be written by someone living under the dome. It's similar to the one they did when the book was released. Cast reviews, trailers, some early reviews says it's the pilot is very good. So in about a week we will know for ourselves. Yep, it's not that far away now. June 24th, I believe, is the yep. start. So that's awesome. Can hardly wait. I'm going to ask you just now, what did you think about the poster with the little kid and the dog on each side of the dome? Yeah, it's it's a little cutesy. I, yeah. I would have liked it if it was just the boy putting his hand up, but not the dog raising his paw. I think if the dog just no. was sitting there, I think it would have worked better. But yeah, uh, yeah I think they pushed it a little too hard for that. A little too cute. I yeah. agree. Yeah, just a tad. I... If the dog was just sitting... Kind of, a, and if they yeah. would have done maybe the pose like the old Victrola or RCA Victor records, yeah, you know where he's kind of cocking his head to one side, listening to the to the old gramophone. I think that would have worked yeah. better for that that uh, picture. I really like the other one where they use the almost the same as the book cover with the, the dome over the city. Yeah, uh, yeah. I personally think that's uh, one of the best uh, covers for a King book. Mm -hmm. that's ever been done. I really like that one. Yeah, same here. Alrighty, up next, of course, we are continuing our string of mentioning the upcoming Carrie movie. And if you go over to Han's site, you'll be able to see that there's a new international poster for the Carrie movie, as well as a new trailer. And I like both. And I guess, again, it's kind of the same complaints that people have had about the previous ones, is that they basically tell you the whole story in the in the trailer. And for yeah. for new people to the story, I can understand that. As someone who's very familiar with the story, I'm I'm just get more and more excited each time I see these trailers because it looks like it's really following the book a lot more closely than any other adaptation has before. Yeah, I have one concern with the trailer, and that is when you see Carrie in the classroom and she's looking up at the flag and making it mm -hmm. uh, blow in the wind, and it seems a little bit like she. She will be using her power for her own benefit, while in the book, and she, it's more like when she's angry, she reacts. It's not something she plans. It's more like the anger makes makes her do it. Now it seems a little bit more like she's uh, really doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. So, and another uh, interesting thing is that the new poster that's been released, the uh, international poster, has on some sites been labeled as the Swedish poster. As far as I know, it hasn't been shown anywhere in Sweden yet, so that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see if they, that's the one they will use. Mm -hmm. Moving along, we have new two new covers for upcoming book books, and even though the books aren't new, this is new editions of the book. The first one is Subterranean Press. They are doing a limited edition of The Shining that's going to be released this fall, and my guess is that it, it will be released about the same time as uh, Doctor Sleep. It's a illustration about the ghost of uh, Overlook Hotel and Jack sitting at a bar. I've been reading a little bit about it on the internet and uh, it, it has been uh, received with a mixture of feelings from the fans. Mm. Some like it and some really doesn't like it. So Interesting. I, yeah, and I think it's pretty nice. I, I kind of like it. But what are the complaints about the people or the issues uh, of people that don't like it? Well, I... Uh, uh, they they just don't seem to like it. it it's oh. not the right one for Shining, they think. And, okay, uh, not the right style? or. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And the other cover is for the... Pet Cemetery. Exactly. And that one is, let me see how many years was it? 30 years? Yep. Edition. Yep. And uh, this one is pretty interesting because... And I will say this as well. It hasn't been confirmed that this is the actual finished cover. It could be a placeholder. But about this cover, I have heard no one who says anything positive. <laughs> it seems like everyone hates this cover. So, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, the the letters are a little bit like they've been blown up. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure. I think for a limited edition, I don't think it's good enough. Yeah, it's a little generic. I, I, I agree with the complaints. It's it doesn't It doesn't really capture the mood of the pet cemetery either like this looks more like a cemetery for people almost really yeah because of the perspective of the crosses and that yeah i think people are expecting maybe like the archway 
being the title into the cemetery or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Whereas this is a little bit generic. And I remember the one with the cat <laughs> on the cover. Yeah. That, that's probably one of the best ones. So, yeah, I, I think they need to put a little more effort into this one as well. Yeah. And maybe they're just putting it out for feedback. Who knows? Yeah. Hopefully they are. Be. Yeah. Alrighty. So this next item is really dear and dear to Hans's heart. The yep. Stephen King movie quiz book is coming out in August. So I think, in all fairness, Hans, you should talk about this, not me. Yeah. Well, it's a quiz book about the movies based on Stephen King's books. Short stories, dollar babies, a lot of different uh, movies. It's me, Brian Freeman who, from Cemetery Dance, and Kevin Quigley, who uh, we have spoken to in this podcast as well. Yep. And it's illustrated by Glenn Shadborn. Who nice. Illus- illustrated uh, several books mm-hmm. by King. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of work put into this book, so I hope people will like it. But they will have to struggle a little bit with, with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially in the state of Googling, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The last item that we have is that the the iBook, the hard listening book that we talked about yeah. on our previous co- podcast is out this week as well. And that of course features all the members from the Rock Bottom Reminders or Remainders and uh all the proceeds for this book are going to charity and uh, I know that we had talked about some people thought that the price was a little high in the last podcast i actually think it's a pretty reasonable price for all the content that you're getting i'm looking forward to reading these four different stories written by the, some of the authors and you have to f- try to figure out one which one is actually the one that stephen king wrote so that should be a lot yeah. of fun yeah and this is also a book that has video clips audio pictures so it, it's not just a text book so it's it's more than a book it's more like a media experience so Mm-hmm. I think it, it, it's it's the best kind of ebook. Yeah. So yeah. I definitely think it's worth checking out. Alrighty. And that is what we have for the news today. Lots of interesting stuff. Hope you enjoyed it. Now we're going to give Bev Vincent the word and talk about his book. This is great. What's our job? We'd like to drive around, pick up stiffs, or what? It's time for reviews from the night shift. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Lillian Lou podcast. This time I'm running solo with a special guest, Bev Vincent. Hello, Bev. Hello there. How are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. And it's Providence that on May 19th, 2013, we are doing an interview about Bev's new Dark Tower book, as 19 is such an important number in the Dark Tower series. And Bev's been busy on several fronts, professional writing career, as well as Stephen King-related material, Bev. So why don't you just uh, give us a quick update as to what you've been uh, doing lately? Well, the most recent thing, which I've already finished and turned in, is I've contributed the afterword to the 30th anniversary edition of Pet Cemetery that uh, PS Publishing is going to be putting out this year. Oh, very cool. And how did how did that come about for you? Well, they're doing two this year. They're Christine and Pet Cemetery are both 30th anniversary books. Okay. And I'm on Pete Crowther's mailing list, and we've dealt in the past and met a couple of times. And so we sent out the uh, original announcement for the two books, and he indicated who the artists might be and who was going to be doing the uh, introductions for the books. Michael Marshall Smith is doing Christine, and Ramsey Campbell is doing Pet Cemetery. And then he had somebody lined up for the afterword for Christine, and it turns out it's going to be Rich Chismar from Cemetery Dance. Mm-hmm. And he said he was looking for suggestions for somebody to do the afterword for Pet Cemetery. And so as soon as I saw that, I wrote him and I suggested me. <laughs> <laughs> and he was quite thrilled uh, with the suggestion. Hey, why not? Because Pet Cemetery is... I was able to write quite a nice story about Pet Cemetery because there were certain elements of that book that were important to me and made a nice story about how I first read the book. And also with the Dark Tower tie-in, Pet Cemetery was the way a lot of people found out that the Dark Tower existed because it was listed in the front of that book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thrilled to be able to just put pen to paper and write a little story about Pet Cemetery's impact on me and the book itself and just the experience of reading it. That sounds very cool. I, I look forward to reading that. I, what kind of a word limit were you, were you on with that? He didn't give me one. Oh. Uh, I think I ended up with something on the order of 1,000 or 3,000 words, which is it's a, it's, it's a good length for that, for that sort of an essay. Right. So it's really my first, other than a single word, Mm-hmm. It's my first direct contribution to a book Stephen King's name is the author on the cover. Wow, that's and, really cool. <laughs> and, and, and the single word is, I was the one who suggested the subtitle for Song of Susanna. Oh, okay. I was working on the road to the Dark Tower, and they were at 
the point where they were starting to reissue the early books mm -hmm. and they were branding them with these new regard redemption R subtitles right and they hadn't gotten into the forthcoming books yet and so i just said you know if you guys haven't decided on one yet i've got the perfect word for it and that was reproduction so mm. and that was ultimately what they used in the book very cool and that's a nice segue into your current book which is the dark tower companion now you had already written one companion book to the dark towers which was the road to the dark tower which was released back in september 28th 2004 and this book comes at a different time and place uh, because now the Dark Tower series is done and we've actually had a additional novel written for it. So can you tell me what was the impetus for this follow-up book and how the difference between this one and The Road to the Dark Tower? Probably the, the main motivating factor was the announcement that there would be a Dark Tower movie. Mm -hmm. And I believe, I may be wrong, I'll have to go back and look it up, I believe that the first announced date for the first film, when it was going to be a Warner picture, I think it was going to be today, mm -hmm. or somewhere around here. It was going to be in 2013 anyway. And so I thought that there would be an audience of people who might be coming to the Dark Tower series from outside of the books. Mm -hmm. People who saw the movies and might want to know more about the books. And so I thought, well, here's a chance. Let's update The Road to the Dark Tower. There's been... Some developments in the interim there's the the wind through the keyhole there's also the whole long series of marvel graphic novels that started after the road to the dark tower came out and so i thought you know i can update the book when i talked to my agent about it he suggested something totally new would probably be better so i decided to take a different approach to a companion the road to the dark tower was really designed for people who've already read the series. The first chapter is the only one that you can read without getting into spoiler territory. And I make that very clear in the book. Don't go on because I'm going to ruin the end right from the beginning of chapter one. <laughs> There's right. uh, no way to discuss the Dark Tower series in depth analytically without showing how the beginning relates to the end and how things in book one call forward to things in book five. And so mm -hmm. it was really more of a okay we've all shared this experience let's walk through it again and let me point out some things that you might not have observed along the way right the dark tower companion is designed for people who've read the series but also for people who've never read it who may be just curious about what it's about perhaps they've read the the graphic novels and they want to know more ultimately maybe they will have seen the film adaptations but it's also sort of a refresher course for people who want to look up things about the dark tower series what book was a certain character in where did certain events happen and i tried to be as comprehensive as possible just about everything that i could think of that applied to the dark tower there's a section or a chapter on it right and so it's a little bit of a backwards approach the first book was incredibly in-depth and the second one is more casual it doesn't have quite as much analysis until the very end when i have a few essays on what i think the series is all about and what certain things in the book might mean Mm -hmm. But I've had now the benefit of about 10 years to step back a bit and look at the series a little bit more generally. And there, there were a couple of things that I'd always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. uh, the ideas came to me after The Road to the Dark Tower. And one was I always wanted to do a Manhattan travel guide to the dark tower <laughs> right and I'd, I'd actually discussed it with my editor for the road to the dark tower he was a big dark tower fan too and we bandied things back and forth but then unfortunately he left the company and moved to a different publisher and so that project sort of went into limbo uh -huh. so i got to revisit that in the dark tower companion um there's a, a section which is a map with all of the important locations that i could track down right within Man manhattan and so if you ever make a a trip there you can go see the dark tower you can go see the place where jake was hit by a car the place where uh, irene's apartment might have been all of, all of those locations uh, that we could nail down as as much as possible right yeah i, I can i'm looking at it, the map right now in, in your book here on page 244 and 245 it's the dark tower guide to manhattan yeah and it's a pretty exhaustive list it's it's very cool to be able to map these fictional story elements against the uh, you know the real world map of downtown manhattan and it's amazingly consistent there are one or two details which are that you can't really nail down, like the, the bowling alley where Jake used to bowl. I know what street it's on, but I don't know the cross streets, so mm. we can't firm that one up. And, and there's one time when Jake goes to see a museum, and the museum that King names 
geographically it's too far away from where Jake is wandering at the time. So I, I think he probably uh, meant a, a different uh, museum. So I uh, sort of give reference to both of them. Okay. And as fascinating is your map of Midworld. And actually, I guess you got to flex your creative muscles a little bit with this map for reasons that you outline in, in the book. I did. There have been other maps of parts of Midworld. Mm -hmm. Robin Firth has done different sections. There's a map of the end world area. There's a map of Gilead. But there's never been one that tries to put it all together. And for fairly good reason. Midworld is... Well, it's uh, unstable. Right. Distances change from day to day. Directions change. And so when I first started to tackle this, I wasn't confident that the whole thing would come together. Mm -hmm. I would just find too many contradictions and incongruities that you'd have to sort of put a big squiggle and say there's something over here, but this region we can do in this region, but how it all comes together isn't going to work. Right. But fortunately, in The Wind Through the Keyhole, King provides an additional piece of information that we'd never had before, and that is that Gilead is on the north-south beam. Uh -huh. And so once we know that, then we can put everything in relative to each other. Right. And before that, Gilead could have been anywhere. Mm -hmm. But in the story of the wind through the keyhole, the backstory, the whole adventure takes place on the north beam, Aslan's beam. And there is reference made to the fact that further to the south, it passes through the Great Hall of Gilead. And then another piece of information is that the little railway line that goes to Dabaria used to go all the way west to the Mohane Desert. Mm. And once I started dropping things in, the railway line is one of the last things I added. And lo and behold, when I extended it, it went all the way over to where I had posted the Mohane Desert. Wow, oh, nice. I felt very proud of myself <laughs> that day. Very good. There are still some incongruities or things that you can't really explain. Mm -hmm. For example, if there's a north beam, there cannot be a northwest beam because, you know, there's beams are like the hands on the clock. Mm -hmm. And so northwest is between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Right. So there's a north-northwest beam and there's a west-northwest beam. But the beam that Roland and his friends travel through the whole series is described as the northwest-southeast beam. Mm -hmm. And so... You have to pick one or the other, and I, I chose to take the one that's more at the 11 o'clock position just because it made things work better in the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the scale of it, when you look at it this way, it, it, it makes things things seem closer together than I had had in my mind. But, you know, it's an, it's interesting how it all does, uh, all like with the, the extrapolations that you've made, it really does map together quite well. To I mean, putting in the map the, uh, from Blaine the Mono, for example. Yeah. I mean, we know that that is... 6,000 miles or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we also know that in Roland's childhood, the distance from Gilead to the Western Sea was only about 1,000 miles. Right. So that's a contradiction, but it's taken Roland, how, how long? Centuries? A millennium? Yeah. To cross that distance. Yeah. And so given the fact that the tower is unstable and it's made things shift in Midworld, then you can sort of hand wave and say, okay, it used to be a thousand miles, but now maybe it's more like 10,000 miles. Right. And we know that Lud is supposed to be, in our world, is supposed to be like a dystopic version of, is it St. Louis, I believe? Or... Well, geographically, St. Louis, but physically, mm. it's New York. New York. Okay. And the skyline and everything looks like New York. The bridge that they cross is like the George Washington Bridge. Right. But it's located conceptually around St. Louis. Okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, I was wondering if you were ever trying to map those over top of each other very much, or... I don't think you really can. can. Okay. Because th there's a one point where, I mean, th there's just too many contradictions. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think it's ever really meant to map one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. uh, because the Western Sea, we think, you know, that's got to be Pacific, but you get not too far inland and you're in New York and there's a whole lot of stuff <laughs> beyond that. And yeah. Ambry is supposed to be essentially on the Gulf of Mexico or in Mexico. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I, I don't, I think I would break my mind trying to do that. <laughs> yeah. The, the beauty of, of the story is, uh, and because King, when he was first writing, he did make some errors, which he later, like Co-op City, which he later just incorporated into the story. You could say that because Roland's done this more than once, that 
every time he's come back through, things have been moved around a little bit because it's a different iteration of the timeline. So Sure, or, or maybe there are some worlds where New York City is in the middle of the continent. Yeah. yeah. So it's... You can always make those arguments. To me, that always seems a little bit like hand-waving to excuse some of King's uh, mistakes, but oh, okay. there are more worlds than these. You, know, yeah. you, you could design a new world where you know, if Co-op City can move, then anything can move. Exactly. Right. Uh, okay, so like the cause of wheel, we will be coming back to some of these topics a little bit later on in the interview, but I just wanted to go over the structure of your book. You've mentioned you covered the Dark Tower books. You also covered all the rest of King's books, which is quite a task in itself, considering how much he's put out, especially in the last couple of years. It's just phenomenal. As well, have you, you had some interviews and uh, you talk about artwork and the to me surprisingly uh, you spend a significant amount of time on the graphic novels as well is that because they're something newer or newer and something that's never really been investigated before okay but they're still coming out there's one or two more issues left to go but nobody has really come looked at the whole graphic novel series analytically to see how it relates to king's world right and one of the issues I had to decide on early on was, how do I treat this? Is this canon or is this expanded universe? Right. And after my interview with King, which we'll talk about in a little bit, his attitude toward it is, Robin knows a lot about Midworld. I trust her to do what she wants, but I don't consider... King saying, I don't consider myself held down to anything that appears in these books. Right. And in fact, the wind through the keyhole pretty much contradicts certain things that arise in the in the graphic novels. So I, I chose to look at them as an expanded universe. Okay. This is perhaps a different timeline. It's a different iteration. They had to make some storytelling choices because of the graphic novel, novel format. So it's not a perfect adaptation of the written books. Mm-hmm. Plus, they go off and they introduce all sorts of stories which were never in the books at all or only alluded to. Mm -hmm. So much like the Discordia interactive game on King's website, I look at these two as being expanded universe. Somebody else playing in King's sandbox with his blessing and his oversight but given the freedom to go off and do things on their own. Right. Yeah, the Discordia interactive game is interesting, uh, and the second chapter is uh, still not launched yet. Uh, I guess it's, uh, according to the website, it's going to be in the summer now, but I, I look forward to interest with, to that. And it's just amazing how much people, other people can bolt on to King's work. It's just such a vast piece of creation. It's uh, quite amazing. Yeah, they, and, and some of the same people have been involved in, in both projects. Uh, Robin Firth is the, I guess, creative director or director of the Discordia project. Mm -hmm. And so some of the storylines, there's, there's interviews with her and with Brian Stark in the book about how they sort of sat around at this restaurant and brainstormed ideas right. and about what would happen to this Op 19 character from the, the first chapter of Discordia when he gets to the end of the tunnel and ends up in the rotunda in FedEx Station in, in Midworld. And they've got quite quite an interesting new storyline for things that are going on over there. Mm -hmm. it, it involves new characters and new uh, confrontations and crises, but it's all related to the Dark Tower mythos fundamentally. Yeah, it's uh, the, the concept sounds very interesting, uh, to be sure, and I, I look forward to seeing uh, th when it does launch. Next part of the uh, the book that I'd like to talk about is you, you did a, f a fair number of interviews as well, and two of them stand out. The, the first one we'll talk about is the one that you did with Ron Howard and Akiva Goldsman and because of the Dark Tower movies, which are is almost becoming like a, a saga unto itself. So why don't you tell me about that? I was very pleased that they agreed to be interviewed for this book. Yeah. Generally, you know, people who are working on a project, but it hasn't yet sort of kicked into gear can be hesitant to mm -hmm. talk about it, especially at the detail that they were willing to discuss it. So Marcia DeFilippo at King's office put me in touch with their assistants and they both agreed right away to, to do the interviews. And so I got them scheduled, and Akiva Goldsman was supposed to be on a Saturday. And Ron Howard's hadn't really been nailed down yet because he was in England uh, working on the movie Rush, right. uh, the, the Formula One movie that's coming out this year. Mm -hmm. And so I was sort of playing around with various different ways that I was going to record these interviews. And I have this little gadget that fits between the phone line 
and plugs into the back of the computer so you can get both ends of a phone conversation. And I wanted to test it out on a couple of different phones just to make sure I had everything all set up. And so I happened to have it with me in my, uh, my gear when I went to work on one Friday and had brought up the Audacity program that I used to record. All right. And I got this call on my cell phone from my wife saying, Ron Howard's going to call you like in about 10 minutes. Can you do the interview right now? <laughs> and as it happened, I could. I had my notes, my questions. I had the gear. I was able to take, you know, a step out from my, my day job and uh, spend half an hour on the phone. Mm -hmm. And it, the interview might not have happened otherwise or could have been delayed. But it mm -hmm. just happened that everything was there. And I just say, oh, I was lucky. Very cool. Plugged everything in, got the program up. He, his assistant called. They passed me over. And he was in the car driving back to wherever he was staying after a day on the set. Okay. And we spent about 30 minutes on the phone. And he and both he and Akiva Goldsman are really, really enthusiastic about this project. Oh, it's, it's good to hear. It's something that they seem bound and determined to make. It's just a matter of how it's all going to come together. Right. And so I talked to Akiva Goldsman a little after that, a couple of days later. And he's really the one who brought the project to Howard in the first place. They were working together on A Beautiful Mind. Right. And a Goldsman had discovered The Gunslinger pretty much in the same way I had. He, he got the, uh, the hardcover of the second edition of The Gunslinger in, in the early 1980s, and he was hooked and followed along with the series as the books came out over the years. And he kept talking to uh, Ron Howard, you know, we've, we've got to do this book about Roland The Gunslinger. We've got to keep doing this. It got to the point where Howard was could see a place where they might be able to do it in terms of his scheduling. And then they were a little bit disappointed to find out that J.J. Abrams and his group were looking at doing it. Mm -hmm. But then when the announcement came out that they were going to step away from it, they got in touch with King to see if he would entertain an assignment from them on how they were going to do it. And King was quite enthusiastic. And so they uh, put together this proposal, which is really quite revolutionary. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, there's never been something that's attempting to make use of so many different media to tell a single story or a single set of stories. There's the motion picture aspect, and they want to reserve those for the more epic parts of the storyline. Right. And then they have these miniseries, essentially TV miniseries, mm -hmm. in between that they devote to the more character-driven small screen aspects that we've seen so much of on television lately. Mm -hmm. So many good series like, you know, The Wire and Dexter, where you can really get intense and really get inside the characters and not worry so much about the, the, the huge epic scope, the, the, the big graphics and special effects. Right. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. Plus, they also talk about wanting to do video games and because there's so much material they're just right. trying to figure out what to do with all yeah. of it because there's so much but they don't plan or they didn't at that time plan to do the adaptation right from book one through book seven and there's a very good reason for that book one as king will acknowledge hasn't always been an inviting invitation to readers right. a lot of people started mm -hmm. the first book and turned away from the series yeah and when you think about not a lot really happens in that book. So much of it's internal. Right. It's not what you would want to adapt as the first movie of a huge franchise. And so they have ideas about taking later material and reorganizing things. And it's, yeah. I'm quite excited by it. I think that there will be people who will be upset to find out that they're not planning something linear that's really sort of strictly book one, book two, book three, and so on. But I think we have to give the filmmakers room to flex their creative muscles and come up with something that will appeal not only to longtime readers of the series, but to invite in this whole new audience of people who aren't familiar with it at all. Mm -hmm. From your book, I've read that, what their plans were as well, and I'm very excited. I, I think they've come up with a fantastic entry point for the average person off the street that doesn't know anything about the series. And like you said, you want to get it, the entry point into the story, for the, which really gets the, the viewers, the listeners, the readers, who, whoever the audience is going to be, emotionally invested in what's going on and i i think what they've 
really nailed uh, how to do that with this. And like kind of like a Lost series, the, the earlier books would be good flashback material for, or character building and things like that. So I I, I really like what they uh, how they thought this out quite a bit. It remains to be seen. You know, there, there have been so many different financing and studios involved. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was their original concept. Yep. And then when th- that project dissolved and they went to Warner's, they asked Akiva Goldsman to go back and rewrite the first script. Mm-hmm. And he was still in the process of doing that at the time where I interviewed him, so he wasn't able to go into any detail on that. But conceptually, that may have been quite different than what they were originally planning. Right. However, that project funding collapsed too and a new company called mrc has stepped in and said they're willing to finance at least one movie right that has russell crowe in it uh, as roland and if it's successful then they would consider more Mm -hmm. but then brian grazer who's a co-producer with these guys said that they're also talking to some financier from silicon valley who wants to finance the whole thing the way that they originally conceived it. Yeah, that kind of blows my mind. <laughs> so what will happen, when it'll happen, how it'll happen, still very much up in the air. Mm-hmm. But when it happens, people who see the movies, if they want to know more, they now have a nice companion to go back to and uh, fill in all the bits and pieces. It's nicely time for you to have this already there for people to grab, so that's great. Really, really hoped that it was going to come out when the first movie came out. That yeah, was the original sure. plan, but then... Yeah. Life got in the way, uh, not from my perspective, from everybody else's. Yeah. Well, that just means that you'll just have to do another update, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of nice to to have in your back pocket. Absolutely. So up next, then, is the interview that was the one that you did with Mr. King, and you did that one over the phone as well, right? Correct. Yeah. I would say probably three quarters of the interviews I did for, the, for this book were done by phone, mm-hmm. which is nice in immediacy, and it gives you a yep. chance to follow up. Uh, it it, it me- makes them a lot longer to do, though, because the transcribing process can be painstaking. Yeah. The, the one that I did with uh, Richard Eisenhower was a really, really long interview, and it took me a long time to transcribe that one. Mm. But this is really the first time that I've interviewed King. Right. Uh, and it was a strange experience because we've sort of developed this casual email friendship where we sort of shoot notes back and forth to each other about books we're reading or TV shows. And to step back from that and sort of say, okay, let's get business-like now and let's do this formally mm-hmm. felt a little bit unusual. But it was it was great. I mean, he's clearly been interviewed gazillions of times. And yeah. He knows how to give you a, a, you know, a complete answer so that you can, uh, you know, have full sentences. Mm-hmm. And he, he knows what he wants to talk about, what he what doesn't want to talk about. There was funny, there was like one question I asked him, you know, do you want to comment on that? And he just said no. Yep. That's, you know, uh, that's fair, fair enough. And, and, the, uh, that's... and I even included that in the interview. Just yeah. because so when that was, happens uh, for you, does that kind of take you back a step? Or you just, not, were you able really. to just roll with it? I just roll it because, you know, I, I was pretty sure that there were certain things that he, he there's, there's things that he wants to keep in his back pocket to use himself. And uh, yep. I was, he, I'm, unlike uh, Howard and Goldsman, he's fairly hesitant to talk about things that are, in progress or in the future right so i just thought you know let me give it my best shot because <laughs> uh, back when i did the road to the dark tower i i read email, i'd email him a few questions every now and then as i was working through it and things that observed and usually he'd give me an answer and then he gave me this really cryptic answer about uh, did you know that roland had that there was something i had read in wizard and glass which made it seem like roland had a sibling mm. and so i asked him about this and he said yes in fact he has two a brother and a sister Mm. And as I continued working the book, I sent him, you know, do you want to follow up on that? And he was just busy with other stuff and he never got back to me. Right. So I thought, okay, I've got him on the phone line now. I'm going to sort of put it to him. Do you want to talk about this? And that's where he said no. But then he sort of backed up a bit and he gave me a little bit of information about Roland's sister, mm-hmm. which you can read about in the interview. So it's clear to me that the Dark Tower is still in his mind. Yeah. And he he did talk about the possibility of, more Dark Tower stories. And one of the reasons why he backed away from the Marvel series a little bit was he didn't want to get his ideas overwritten by what they had come up with. Right, right. Especially for, he said, the, the Battle of Jericho Hill. Mm-hmm. He said that one he didn't want to see the, the graphic novel at all. I mean, he, he read the scripts and all that, but he didn't want the visuals okay. because he thought that that was of everything left uh to, to to delve into that was the one territory he thought he might visit again 
Right. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting interview. Like you said, when he said no to that one question, I was like, "Ooh, I'd get all, I'd get all flustered." But uh, <laughs> but and and then it's always I always kind of have to chuckle. He says, "But I don't know anything about that," and that's kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that's always the interesting thing, too. Yeah. You really do get the sense he doesn't know. Yeah. He doesn't know until he starts to write. Yeah. But, but he may have an idea. Yes, he definitely has an idea. But like you said, he's a discovery writer, so yes. he hasn't really thought it all out, out, out yet. I find the, the interview very interesting because you had put forth thought in one of the book summaries or earlier, the Little Sisters of Illyria, that you thought maybe the sisters of from Serenity yes. may have morphed into the sisters of Illyria. And I thought that was a very fascinating possibility. And in the graphic novels... That possibility is expanded even more in some of the uh, ancillary materials that Robin Firth has written at the end. Oh, okay. She's got a, a three-part story called the, the Dark Bells, which deals with the Little Sisters, and, and there are some implications that they may have been something like the Sisters of Serenity originally, and they were corrupt. Oh, okay. So that's... Yeah, I have to confess, I haven't read all the graphic novels, and I didn't go through the entire section of that book. I just went through it quickly to see how much more I still had to read, but that was a fascinating connection. So the, the, the parts with Jericho Hill and the, the fact that Roland has siblings, it's all very points towards the fact that King has definitely more stories he wants to tell in the Dark Tower world. The team that started the graphic novel series, in their first meetings, they sat down together and Robin Firth was in calling in from England on the phone and she was sort of taking notes because King just sort of sat there and it, over the course of about 20 minutes spouted out all these little stories about Roland's childhood that had never been part of the novels. Right. And they were essentially the, the germ of what Robin and Peter David and them ultimately used to, to tell the additional stories that are in the graphic novels. Very cool. I was also fascinated just by the logistics of how comics are done. Because mm -hmm. I don't read many comics. And the Dark Tower ones aren't typical of contemporary ones because they realized that a significant portion of their audience would be people who weren't regular comic readers. Right. And so they essentially simplified things like layout to make them very linear instead of using, you know, clouds within clouds and bubbles and nonlinear page layouts and things like that. Right. But I just wanted to hear how they did it. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of my favorite interviews is the one with Richard Eisenhoff, who's the only artist who was with the series all the way through. He, he did all the color work and he also did some of the pen and ink work for the some of the standalone issues. Right. And I, I had a great time talking to him. Uh, that was a that was a fun interview. Cool. I just have two questions sprung up the, over the course of your interview. The first one might be, I don't know, too large for you to answer, but you mentioned at the beginning that 10 years later, your perspective on the series is different than, than it was before. Uh, is there anything specifically about the, how you look at the series now, 10 years later, than you did before? I think the essays that I wrote for the end of The Dark Tower Companion mm -hmm. were my, it's sort of what I've arrived at as a conclusion about what certain parts of the series mean. Right. Or how I see, I don't want to give too many spoilers away here, mm -hmm. what redemption means for Roland, let me say that. Right. And at the time that I wrote The the Road to the Dark Tower, it was all so new that I hadn't really had a lot of time to ruminate on that and discuss it with other people. Mm -hmm. And I did have some ideas, but I've sort of over the years have sort of come to a conclusion what I think Roland needs to do to avoid what happens. Okay. And so I sort of bounced that off King even when I talked to him. I said, you know, I, I think this and I think that. And he was cagey, but he did sort of point to the first book. And he said, the answers are all in the first book. Right. Roland's redemption lies in especially the revised version of The Gunslinger. Mm -hmm. And, okay, you know, the author, of course, has his ideas. My ideas, I understand what he's saying, and, and they do sort of fall in line to a certain extent. But I have a fairly concrete scenario that I would map out for... Roland's redemption. It's to me, it's just a quaint little story, uh, one that the way I would like to see it happen. I'm sure most readers have their own alternatives, mm -hmm. but I had the opportunity in this book to sort of set it down on paper and say, "This is how I think Roland's saga comes to an end." Okay, I urge everybody to check that out in the book. It's a very interesting section of the book, to be sure. For myself, when I finished the story, I thought, you know, "I think the next cycle is going to be the last one." But now that I've the distance of time, I'm I'm not so sure about that anymore. And King told me very clearly when I was working on the Road to the Dark Tower that it's not. You're right. Okay, that's good because uh, 
<laughs> and the way that came up was while I was working on the road to the Dark Tower, Kingdom Hospital was running. Right. And there was an episode late in the series called Butterfingers about a, that's essentially the story of the Boston Red Sox player who fumbled the ball and lost the World Series for them back in 1986. Oh, yes. And in the fictionalized version, this guy gets a chance to go back many years and do it over and get it right. Oh, okay. Because he's sort of the whipping dog. And his life's been miserable ever since. Everybody always calls him Butterfingers. And yeah. He's afforded, through the magic of the Kingdom Hospital, the chance to go back and set it straight. And so I, I emailed King and I said, you know, is, is this sort of a hint that Roland's next time is his last? And he said, no. He said, Kingdom Hospital's just television. Mm -hmm. He said, in the real world, character improvements accrue gradually. Ah, okay. And Roland is a little bit better the next time around and a little bit better and a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But it could be 9 or 19 or 99 or who knows how many more iterations before he achieves perfection. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, argues, you know, what does perfection mean for Roland? And that's what leads me into my essays at the end of the Dark Tower Companion. Right. Yeah, I, that's good to know, because I, <laughs> I was kind of thinking it from a story, from a storytelling point of view, you want to tell the version that's as close to the end as possible. But I just think there's, because I predicated all of that of, being on him remembering to pick up the Horn of Eld at the Battle of Jericho. But there's major events in the first book that he'd have to change, I think, before he would be ready to make that final step. And at the very end, too, the decision he makes when he gets to the point where he can go to the Dark Tower, I, I think that's, that's also... Right. So to, me, that, to me, that's one of the, the pivotal decisions. Yeah. The other ones along the way, certainly, the character uh, improvements he needs to make to get to the point where he can stand in front of the tower and yeah. honor it. But it's the next decision. That, yeah. that to me is the big one yeah and it all sort of relates back to the classic concept of hubris yep you know i'm even open to the possibility that he has to make some changes early on in an iteration which means that what happens after that is completely different yeah you know yep. if, if what happens at the end of the first book is different then people that Ka provides for him to succeed in the rest of his mission may be different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, because Ka seems to give him the tools that he needs to achieve whatever it is that's coming along. Yeah. And if he takes different paths, then maybe he needs different tools and different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's it's all in flux and each decision leads down a new branch. It's uh yeah, it's a very <laughs> it, you can really get lost into it like when you were trying to do your maps there. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's a fascinating story and and like for King being such a discovery writer to create something so layered and complex just really kind of blows my mind, especially over such a long period of time. Yeah, exactly. So with all of that, my last question for you is, is there anything in the book that we haven't brought up that you would like to discuss or, or mention at this point? Not in particular. I, I think we've, we've sort of covered it. A, a big chunk of the book is, is a glossary. It takes up a couple of hundred pages. Right. And one question people ask me is, how is this book different than Robin Firth's Concordance? And beyond the sort of essays and synopses of the stories and the interviews and that my glossary is laid out a little bit differently from hers hers is a real concordance and it's structured the same way that a biblical concordance is mm -hmm. it's grouped by themes and categories and so if you wanted to look up north the weed eater you would go to the tall section of the concordance and there you would see all of the characters and all of the uh, locations and that that relate to that particular incident in the storyline and i decided to make mine just more linear and i've only divided it into two there's the people places and things from our world and the people places and things from mid-world and even there i sort of ran into some gray areas because there are people that we only meet in mid-world but they're from our world mm -hmm. for example the uh, the breakers Th those are really our world people but we rarely see any of them outside of mid-world right okay very good. Beyond this book, which is entitled The Dark Tower Companion, Guide to Stephen King's Epic Fantasy, which is out now at pretty well all your major outlet chains, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, I'm assuming a Cemetery Dance. There will be a limited edition uh, coming out later on this year. Here. Okay, um, very good. It will have a little bit of more information in it about, about the later Marvel books because issues have continued to be published since I turned in the manuscript, and so I was able to update that section a little bit. Cool. Uh, actually, all the way to the end, since now we know that the, the next issue in July will be the last one. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of that era, so interesting. For the time being, at least. Uh, For the time being, yeah. 
if the movies come out, it'll get all started up again for sure. Yeah. Very likely. Very likely. Yeah. It keeps turning around. So, Bev, outside of this, is there any other feature projects that you would like to mention at this time? I've sort of been in a mode lately of cleaning out my to-do list. Okay. Because I've been really eager to get back to work on a novel. Uh, and I I need to be fairly single-minded and focused when I do that. So I'm getting all my book reviews up, short stories wrapped up, and I'm not trying not to take on any more obligations, although every now and then people ask and it's hard to say no. Sure. I do have an essay that I need to write for Cemetery Dance for a project that they haven't announced yet. I have another one that I was just invited to do for the end of the year. But beyond that, my main goal for the rest of 2013 is to uh, work on a novel. Okay. Well, we wish you the best of luck with that. And is there anything you want to tell us about the novel, or do you want to keep that close to the best still? Other than the fact that it's a crime novel, mm -hmm. uh, that's... Uh, I mean, I, I have one chapter of about 3,000 words that I wrote two or three years ago. Okay. Earlier this year, my wife and I went on a, a vacation trip to the setting, and I took the video camera along so that I could get some local color for uh, reference material that I can go back to. Mm -hmm. And I, I workshopped this chapter with, with a group of fellow authors. We had a critique group uh, that met over in San Antonio for uh, once a month, and it was it's a great group, uh, some really good writers, but... The, the three hour trip each way to San Antonio was just too much for me. So I uh, mm. had to step away from that. But I got a lot of really good feedback from those authors on this first chapter. And I'm, I'm quite encouraged to, to move forward with it. Cool. Well, we wish you the best of luck with that. And I want to thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on our podcast. I much really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. So there you go, folks. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And uh, if you listen to the outtake at the end of the podcast, you're going to find out that during the, the interview I had with Bev, I had an unexpected guest. And it wasn't Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Okay, and that's it for this podcast. We hope you have enjoyed it. And if you have any comments or thoughts about it, please post them. In the next podcast, we will be doing reviews of Ghost Brothers in Darkland County and Joyland. So if you have any comments for those two books, let us know. We will also be taking a look at uh, the pilot of Under the Dome and uh, let you know what we think about that one. Give us your thoughts and we'll be back next time. Until then, stay safe, but stay scared. Oh, jeez. We got a wasp in here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> a wasp. Ooh. Okay. Um, you just have to hang on for a sec. I'm going to have to get rid of this. <laughs>